I'm going to hand you over in a second to Sushila Nasta, sitting here, who's going to be managing this conversation this morning. And Sushila, as you probably all know, is the founder and editor of Wasafiri, the magazine of international writing based in the UK. It's a second time at Boca, so we're very happy to have her back. And she's going to be having a conversation this morning with David Dabedine, sitting next to her. His first time at Boca, I think we tried to get him once before, but you were, you were doing something in China. You were on the other side of the world at the time. Anyway, he's, this time he was only one ocean away, not three or two. So we're very happy to welcome him to Boca for the first time. They're going to be having a pretty broad-ranging conversation about his work. And there's nothing else for me to say except to ask you to give them a big round of applause to welcome them so we can get the conversation going. So he's published three collections of poetry as well as seven novels. And since your very first collection of poetry, Slave Song, in 1984, um, his writing has just gone on and on to attract further acclaim. Um, he's won the Guyana Prize for Literature three times ac across almost three decades as well as a whole range of other prestigious awards, including the James Tate Black Memorial Prize for fiction for his 1999 novel, A Harlot's Progress, which is set in 18th century London, and the Raja Rao Award for his 2004 novel, Our Lady of Demerara. This book, like The Counting House, which followed in 2005, signals David's continuing preoccupation with history and the writing of histories um, framed by the pornography of empire, to use Wilson Harris's phrase, where he articulates the connections between both sides of such stories, whether they're played out um, on whichever side of the Atlantic and at whatever period in history. And when I was looking at David's sort of the chronology of his long writing career, which covers academic works, um, broadcasts, um, all kinds of things, um, archives from the um, Indo-Caribbean diaspora, I realized that there's this kind of pendulum-like swing between writing about the 18th century and shifting to the Indo-Caribbean, and I want to talk about that a bit as we go on. Um, but I think abiding throughout all of this is a preoccupation with language and the process of writing itself, whether as poet or novelist. Um, so I can't really sum up in this short introduction the extensive range of his contribution to Caribbean letters um, he's got many faces, and he's also currently Guyana's ambassador at large. Um, he was based in China from 2010 to 15, and is now um, non-resident ambassador for Singapore and South Korea. Um, so, David, um, I don't really know where to start, but I think I'm going to start at the beginning and ask you to talk about your early influences as a boy growing up in Guyana. I know... You've written about this on many occasions, um, and I've mentioned this pendulum-like swing between your focus on the Indo-Caribbean and the Black Atlantic slavery experience. So can you tell us a little bit about those elements of your childhood and their impact on your writing? Well, thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Sheila. And I'd like to echo your uh, gratitude to the organizers of BOCAS, Nicholas and Marina and, and others, who've enabled us to be here. And I should say that Sheila is suffering from bad neck pain that is chronic. So if you see her flap her hand towards me, she's not slapping me. It's just an instinctive, an instinctive reaction, right? I'm not Sam Selvon. <laughs> no need to be slapped. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> what can I say? I grew up a long time ago. I was born a long time ago and grew up in a village in, um, New Am in Burbese, which is an Indian village. Uh, my stepfather, my grandfather, my grandparents could not really read or write. And there was no paper in the house. Maybe there was a pencil. But their son went to Pembroke College, Oxford, my uncle, which is Dr. Johnson's college. Dr. Johnson who wrote the dictionary in 18, uh, 1755. So that is a fantastic experience. And it's, a, it's not just a Guyanese experience, certainly not just a family experience. Walter Rodney went to school barefooted, right? You know, m many of our scholars and, 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 and writers came from desperately poor or humble backgrounds. And then, and then through education, were catapulted into, into academia and, and other places. So I grew up in an Indian village. Cows, obviously sheep. I can do a very good cow impression, <laughs> which, which I practiced all my life, and I'll do it now, if I may, yes? Close your eyes. 
This is a cow bellowing in the far savanna, which is a village sand. <laughs> it goes like this. That's true, isn't it? That's a cow in a far savanna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my grandfather had sheep, so I, I went out during the holidays, I'd take the sheep out. But the sheep just they go by themselves, you just follow them. And the cows, and uh, you'd, do, you'd go catching crabs, catching crabs. The crabs mate in the mating season, and then you go with your sack, and you, when, when they're mating, you catch them and put them in the bag, right? And they're still mating. They don't know what's going on, right? <laughs> so we did try to catch the lonesome crabs who were not mating, because they had no prospect of family. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so you, you had this fantastic rural um, upbringing, and of course, the drinking of rum and the swearing, especially the swearing, which is, which is vivid. You know, when, when a guy and he's as drunk and curses you, you know you're cursed. <laughs> when I was in England, by the way, quickly, one of the things about England, the, one of the negative things, many positive things, was that in the 60s, people grunt and guttural, grunts and guttural, you fuck, you pack, you fuck, you go, you can't go, you know. And you used to wish they'd curse you with grammar. <laughs> you used to wish they'd curse you with a Shakespearean flourish with the full felicity of the English language. <laughs> anyway, I do remember in Guyana, people cursing vividly, and it's an art form. Hmm? Then, of course, um, I grew up under the shadow of, um, of um, Rowan Canai, who was the great cricketer then. Um, and then, of course, Cherry Jagan, who was the great politician then. And I, I was fortunate later in life to meet both of them, I met um, Rowan Kanai in, in a ferry crossing the Burbese River, and I was going to Burbese to leave a couple of my books to the local library. So I, I scrabbled around in my suitcase, and I found um, a, 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 a book in which I'd written a poem for him. And I went up timidly to him, and I said, uh, David Dabberty in Warwick University. I mean, he played for Warwickshire, so at least he should know Warwick, right? So I said, I opened a book to the page, and I said, I've written, I've written this poem for you. He looked at it. He looked at it. He said, you spell my name wrong. <laughs> you spell my name wrong. I said, w w what, what? He said, Babulal, it's got one L. <laughs> now, I'd got the bloody spelling from wisdom, right? <laughs> so his only response was to tell me that. And so he, I, I said to him, well, in the second edition, sir, I will correct it. Well, he doesn't know what edition is, right? And he wouldn't take the book. He said, leave it at my mother's place in uh, Port Morant, which I never did, right? I thought he was a little bit uncouth. <laughs> but he may have been shy and fed up with people coming to talk to him, you know? Then I met Cherry Jack, and he came to Warwick many, many times. We invited him. We gave, we gave him, Warwick University gave him the platform. Because you know he was cheated out of power. Cheated out of power every five years. But we treated him like a head of state. Um, we gave him security. We gave him the best rooms at the University of Warwick. We gave him the BBC. He came to conferences. He gave addresses. We really supported him uh, as a university. When I say we, I mean the university. But then again, he was so heroic. I remember at a, conference, at a conference at Warwick, he and I ended up in a toilet, urinating. I had to go through the motions, but I couldn't. There was nothing coming out, because you were in the presence of Lord Krishna. You can't be peeing with Lord Vishnu next door, you know? <laughs> so th these were venerable figures. And of course, the thing about Jagan, if I may end now, is that he never stole from the national treasury. He was, a, he was one of the... He lived, a, he lived a frugal lifestyle. He lived a frugal lifestyle, um, deeply honest, always, always talking about the need to do something about poverty. He actually said to many of us, on many occasions, what's the point of living if you can't do something for the poor? He believed that really passionately, you know. 
So he was, he was, a, he was a, 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 a leader. Now, that was part of my Indianness, if you like, yes? Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, and actually, I should have said when I was introducing you, David asked especially that we dedicate this session yes. to the memory of Sam Selvon, who was a mentor to him and a, and a mutual friend of both of ours, and also Mark to Mark 2017 as the centenary of Indian indenture to the Caribbean. But, so those were the kind of Indian influences, yes. but, but you were kind of... Guyanese boy growing up in a creolized environment. So I just wondered how these different influences impacted on what you later came to write in Slave Song, for example, your first volumes of poetry, Cooley Odyssey. How did those kinds of forces impact on you? And I know Miguel Street was another thing that yes. was important. Well, what can I say, Sheila? Um, we moved from the Indian village to New Amsterdam, which is a mostly African Guyanese um, town, small town, and um, I fell in love. My first love, I was about eight or nine, was with Miss Lambert, who was our teacher, black teacher. I remember being in love with her, you know. I remember being jealous when I saw her with another boy. <laughs> she was about 23, you know. I remember seeing her with, uh, I can even remember the boy now, W.R. Kendall's son. And I thought, you horrible piece of, this is my girl you're out with. So, <laughs> then you, you grew up in an educational environment which was led largely by African Guyanese people. Mm -hmm. and, and these are people who cared for you as a student, you know. They were proud, they were proud of their students. As you know in the Caribbean, you know, teachers are very special or they used to have very special status. So then um, that, that therefore, enhanced your, your personal life. And then when I went to England, obviously you're a minority in a minority, because you're most, mostly Jamaicans are there. Sorry, Eddie. Um, badly behaved Jamaicans, <laughs> mostly. <laughs> and um, so you grow up black. And then the white people didn't necessarily make a distinction always between black and packy, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I did some work in William Hogarth, which led me into scholarship on slavery. Mm -hmm. So I got into, spent many, many years looking at the slave trade and slavery as a result of doing some work on uh, William Hogarth in the 18th century. And the reason I'm a little bit obsessed about the 18th century, to such an extent my wife says, get a life. Get a life. The 18th century is filthy, it's dirty, it's about piss pots emptying in gutters, it's about syphilitic sores, it's about highwaymen, it's about robbery, it's about card cheats. It has the thew and sinew of, of real life, you know. you know. And so that I find fascinating. Because it reminds me of some of the um, landscapes in India. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the fecal matter everywhere and so on. Um, <laughs> so I've been in really, um, I'm really an 18th century person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you came to the plant, sort of Black Atlantic plantation slavery stories through your work on the 18th century rather than through your childhood in Guyana, is that what you're Oh, saying? yes, yes, yeah. through, through yeah. academic research. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, that, that's, so the Indo-Caribbean side was more important initially? No, nothing no. was more important. I, was doing, I, I published a little book on William Hogarth looking at the representation of Africans in the paintings of William Hogarth. And I was giving a talk at London University in 1986, a talk on black British history. And I gave this talk in William Hogarth, showing the paintings, the Harlot's Progress and so on. And a Rastafarian woman who was taller than me, well, most people are taller than me, um, literally braced me up against the wall, literally. I mean, it's lovely when women brace you up against the wall, but on this occasion, it was aggressive. <laughs> and she said to me, why you don't speak about your own people? Why are you speaking about our people? Well, I could have actually said to her, Rastafarianism has its deep roots in India. <laughs> the smoking of marijuana was first done in the Indian plantations, and so on. But no, I was very offended. Well, I was startled, first of all, and then I was offended. And I went home that night, living in Lewisham, teaching at London University, living with a black family, uh, wonderful people and wrote Kuli Mother. Mm -hmm. So that was the first time really in England I felt um, 
Indo-Caribbean. Mm-hmm. It was the very first time it, it came home to me that I was Indo-Caribbean. No, that's because you just assumed it, you know. Yeah. I mean, what you were saying earlier, I mean, just to talk about Britain for a moment, because obviously you spent a large part of your life mm-hmm. in Britain. Um, it was easy to be Indian and black simultaneously in Guyana before you left, and then you turn into a Paki mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. an any mm-hmm. old Asian mm-hmm. in Britain, mm-hmm. um, and you arrived only a year after Enoch Powell's famous um, Rivers mm-hmm. of Blood mm-hmm. speech in 1968. And I think you talk about this, you don't talk about it much in your fiction, but you do talk about it in your first novel, The Intended. Um, mm-hmm. Was that a difficult, I mean, obviously it was a very difficult experience for you, I know, because that's partly autobiographical, that novel. Yes. Um, but it was a kind of transformation that a lot of people from the Caribbean went mm-hmm. through. I mean, for example, Sam Selvon, who shifted yes. from being an East Indian, Indo-Caribbean yes. writer to being a black Londoner, mm-hmm. and, and others. Mm-hmm. Well, what can I say? I mean, um, what can I say? Let me say something positive about England now. What I loved about England, it is the world of books. Everywhere you go in England, is a writer associated with that place. Coventry is Philip Larkin, Stratford is Shakespeare, London is Dr. Johnson, Charles Dickens. There's no, is there any space in England that a writer has not inhabited and has not left his or her imprint? It really is a literary space. And there are libraries everywhere. Although they're being closed, they're not all being closed. There are public libraries everywhere. And you turn the television on, there are programs about books, the radio, so it's, 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 a, it's a world of books. Apart from being a world that calls you a packy, you know, it's also a world of books and learning and the best universities. I used to um, just uh, divert from myself, but walking down Cambridge High Street, walking down Cambridge High Street, you pass Corpus Christi College, and you suddenly remember Milton studied here. Imagine. Milton studied there, and then you walk past another college, and you remember that, um, what's his name who wrote Dr. Faustus? Um, Christopher Marlowe. Christopher Marlowe studied here, and his ghost is meant to be in one of the rooms, right? It was just amazing, then around the corner, Darwin. Darwin studied here, and then around the corner, Newton studied here. So it's a place of learning and inspiration, yes? How are you doing? Yeah. But, but you also were caught between, you know, as a, as a writer who started well, writing in the 80s by yeah. a whole generation of Caribbean writers like Wilson Harris, I, I was, Paul, I, look, I, was, I was lucky. A lot of them are men, yeah. I think, but that influenced you. But yes. there were yes. a whole generation of older I, Caribbean Sheila, writers. Sheila, I've probably not said this in public before. I was lucky in a peculiar sense in that in England I grew up in care, in the care of the local authorities which meant at a very early age in England, which is a challenging experience, a long time ago, um, it meant that you had two choices in life which you made when you were very young. I was taken into care when I was about 14. Um, You can be a bus driver and live in Stockwell in those high rises, which are crime dens, or you can do books. (laughs) It was a simple choice, I did books. But without those experiences, and even with Enoch Powell, when watching Enoch Powell on television, he wiped us out with his eloquence. He was brilliant. He'd drop in a bit of Latin. And then some Asian or West Indian was debating with him. Powell wiped them out. And that's, we also decided we've got to go and go and study and get mastery of the language so we can address Powell. Yes? When Enoch Powell died, I was sad. His death was announced on television by a black, black um, broadcaster. I was in Cambridge. I was walking my dog. You can't get more English than that. <laughs> and I'm feeling sad that Powell has died. This great enemy of ours, part of my childhood, my terror, he's died. You know? But people like Powell forced you into achievement. You know? they, they inadvertently made you want to... Well, as I said, master the idioms as far as you could of the English language. They made you actually read the dictionary, you know? Mm-hmm. Sorry. So, yeah, but to go back to those 
rightly influences from the Caribbean. I mean, just, just to, to, to answer you, I mean, I have to say this um, about the gods, you know, the, the colleges in Cambridge and obviously the very famous people who studied there, but I don't know if you've seen, and I'm going off tangent now for a minute, um, the front cover of Wasafiri at the moment is a library, right. and it's Yinka Shonibari's recent yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. installation, know, yeah. which was in the Turner Contemporary in Margate, mm. which was called the British Library. Mm. Now that library, and I'm not talking about canons now, that library, which is writers in Britain, if you look at this, the names on the spines, mm -hmm. tell a completely different story of what is British writing, if you like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay. I take, a lot of things have changed radically from the last 50 years. Look, having had a grounding in Chaucer to, I think it ended in D.H. Lawrence, then you had the fantastic opportunity of actually meeting real, live West Indian writers like Sam Selvon, you know, and Wilson Harris, who were unfail unfailingly generous to young or emerging writers, unfailingly generous, and full of pleasurable stories, and, and people who cared and gave you advice, you know. I mean, I remember Sam, in 1988, it was the 150th anniversary of the, end, the, the, um, of the arrival of Indians in the Caribbean. And so the University of Warwick made Sam an honorary doctor of letters. And Sam said, now I'm an honorary doctor of letters. I'm not going to talk to Austin Clark anymore. <laughs> I'll tell that. I'm, you can go to hell now, right? <laughs> and Sam would entertain you with stories. Uh, by the way, talking about Austin Clark very briefly. When Sam died, you and I had organized a, 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 a memorial for Sam, and Austin Clark turned up. And we were drinking in the bar in the South Bank on the River Thames, hallowed literary space. And the bar ended, so we had to leave the bar. Then we, we had some drinks, we stayed outside to drink, and, and, and Austin said that he wants to go for a pee. So I said, well, the toilets are closed, but you go over there, and I'll, I'll keep an eye out, right? This is the South Bank Royal Festival Hall. He's having, he's ha West Indians having a pee, right? <laughs> and then it was my turn, he kept an eye out for me. I went back to his hotel, he had drinks. I said, uh, Austin, um, I, I was teaching his novel for many years, A Brighter Sun at Warwick. I said, Austin, how did you um, start writing? Why did you start writing? He said, boy, I went to Canada and I was cold and I didn't have any money, but he saw a, a reader Somebody was doing a reading, a poet. And he went in and sat down. And he said, you should have seen the girls. He said, you should have seen the girls. I thought, I'm going to be a writer. I said, Austin, be serious with me. He said, that is why I started to write, David. Right? <laughs> so, I mean so meeting these people, it was a really great gift. And I can fill you with stories about Selvan when, um, when he, um, he published this, when he and George Lamming took the same boat in 1950, had one typewriter which they shared between them, which belonged to Selvan, an imperial typewriter, a small grey one. Then they went into a men's hostel after that, shared a hostel, then they published their two books, In the Castle of My Skin and A Brighter Sun. And then Sam said, when the BBC paid him for one of his short stories. He said, boy, the paper was thick, 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 thick check paper. And it said on top, BBC, you know? Pay Samuel Dixon, Selvon Esquire, four guineas, not pounds, guineas. He said, boy, I didn't have any money, but I walked all over London <laughs> with a check in my pocket. So you can feel that he was a writer. You can feel he was a writer. <laughs> but I'm going to push you a bit now off your stories. Um, how did they impact on your writing? How did people like Selvon and Wilson Harris, you know, you were saying in a way that the British landscape, that there's a writer in every city. Yes. In a sense, Guyana, when one thinks of Guyanese writers, and I'm thinking of people like Pauline Melville and oh, yes. obviously Wilson Harris, um, it's very much, the, and your own work, it's very much the landscape that comes through. So, I mean, how did these early 
if you like, early Caribbean mentors impact on you? Because in a way, you were part of a generation of people like Fred Daguerre, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Carol Phillips, who were all beginning to write in London at that point in the 80s and 90s and elsewhere in Britain and trying to create a space for themselves which was different in a sense from, the, from the, what these earlier writers had done before. So yes. if you could say something yes. about that. Well, well, you know, Sheila, the, the influence was, um, was threefold. No, twofold, really. One was um, at a personal level, meeting the writers and being inspired by just being in their presence and listening to them and listening to their stories and their jokes and so on, right? I mean, that in itself is inspirational. Secondly, listening to them reading. Um, I remember Pauline Melville came to Warwick to do a reading from um, one of her novels. And I was doing a novel at the time, and I couldn't end the novel. I couldn't think of end this, um, um, the counting house. I couldn't think of how to end this novel. I was stuck in it for about six weeks. Pauline Melville came and did a reading, and I went home and I ended the novel. She was inspirational. And then thirdly, in terms of the, 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 the owing the, the other writers, the other generation, like Roger Mason and so on, they, um, they brought you back home through their fiction. You were stuck in Balham or Tooting. So they, they returned to you a sense of home and language and the people you grew up with, you know, the Miguel Street people. Nye Paul was very influential. And then lastly, and I say this without any modesty, you realize you're a failure as a writer. Obviously, Fred and I, we're failures as writers. Because who came before us? Walcott and, and Naipaul. I mean, how can you achieve that, you know? You know so, so, so it gave you a certain humility. So you realize that these are the, you are the generation that's going to lose out, you know? Or you might have been writing a different story, which well, you were, you know. But. Yeah, but you could never achieve the sensuousness and the lushness and the metaphoric brilliance of a Walcott. I mean, I read Walcott and I have to put it down. It's too painfully beautiful. <laughs> he talked about the, the... Imagine in Tiapolo's Hound, he talks about the dialect of paint. The dialect of paint. Eddie, it's not just language. Paint has its own dialect. He said that Frenchman, um, what's his name, um, who went to, you know, the, the Martinican painter, who went to Paris and painted Parisian rooftops. He said he painted Parisian room to, roof to, rooftops, but with Caribbean light. But when you see the dialect of page, you've got to put it down. It's so beautiful, right? Same with Wilson Harris. I read Harris, and on page 25, there's sudden a rush, like, like somebody's giving you heroin. There's a kind of rush in your blood and in your mind. And you suddenly have this fantastic illumination, having struggled through 25 pages. And you get this illumination, <laughs> and you have to put it down. You put it down, and you think, how did he do that? You know, how did he, how did he come up with this image? So, so people, they, they inspire you by the sheer beauty of what they write. Yeah? and being an example of what you should try to achieve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, they, and their voices are in your, ah, a lot of your fictions. In your head. They can hear them. I mean, um, I went to see Sam the other day. You know, he's in the University of the West in his graveyard. When he came to Warwick, he used to drink everything out. Everything. We had to lock the cupboards, right? <laughs> everything, right? <clears throat> Which was wonderful. Um, and he was full of stories. <laughs> can I tell one last Sam Selvin story? Okay. He said he was sloshing out a bar in Bayswater somewhere. And the bar owner was, I think, a literary Irishman who came to him and said, it's you, Selvon, isn't it? Sam Selvon? Sam said, you know, yes, me. He said, I've just read a review of your novel in The Observer. And Selvon said, well, yeah, I do a bit of writing now and again. You know, Selvon was like that, very, very humble. As soon as he put his mop down and everything, he went and he said he bought five copies of The Observer and read all of them to make sure... <laughs> To make sure it's the same review, right? <laughs> so I went to see him the other day in his grave, beautifully designed by Ken Ramchan. I don't know if Ken is here, you know? And a, and a line from um, A Brighter Sun. And I chatted to him a little while, you know, an old, old mate of mine. And then I left. I said, Sam, 
at least don't hog all the Vestal virgins. Keep one for me. But I'm not coming now, right? <laughs> so because you shared a kind of friendship with the writers, there's inevitably a kind of, is osmosis the right word? You know, or by hanging around with them, you hope some of their genius will touch you. You know. <laughs> hey, I'm going to move off. Uh... Yeah. So I'm being very indirect, because I hate talking no, about I'm myself. I'm trying to get you onto your no, work. No, <laughs> I'm bored. I once had to do a reading in London, and I fell asleep. No. I, I give you my word of honor. I give you my word of honor. I had to do a reading, and I fell asleep. OK, right? well, I don't think the audience will fall asleep if you do a reading. <laughs> anyway, I, I want to. You can't believe me. I'm going to push you now. You don't no, no, no. That I fell no. <laughs> Thank God Admiral Johnson was there. I said, Admiral, you do the reading. <laughs> okay. So when you started out as a writer, your passion was clearly poetry, first of all. Um, and with it, a desire to shift the frames of history and to tell those stories of the silenced stories um, in Slave Song and in Cooley Odyssey. And a lot of those early poems are about journeying in the diaspora and so on. Um, I just wondered if you wanted to talk about the genesis of those early books, because they were, in a sense, at the time when they came out, quite a big breakthrough. But what was interesting about them, in a sense, is you write in a Creole voice, but then you provide a translation and a preface, almost in an ironic, subversive voice in standard English. So I just wondered if you wanted to talk about that a bit, or read. Well, what can I say, Sheila? Um, <laughs> For this book, as I had to revisit what I'd written in the past, and I give you my word of honor, I couldn't recognize anything, or I recognize very little. Because when a book is published, I never read, I never read it. I, Naipaul says that a writer must be responsible for his words or her words, and apparently you can, you can read chunks of his fiction. When my novel is published, or book of poems, that's it, I smell it, you know see the cover price, you know, or whatever. And then you put it away, and then, when you, and then you select two passages from it, which you go all over the, wh whoever invites you, you keep reading the same two passages. But what precedes it and goes after it, I cannot remember. I honestly can't, I was looking at it the other day, talking about you, and saying, oh shit, what was that about, right? So, so I like to be not familiar with what I've written. Hmm? So next time I write, I can't think, oh yeah, I wrote that before. You can still write it again, but maybe in a different context. So yes, in the 90s, we were very conscious, myself and the other Caribbean writers, my fellow Caribbean writers, that we were doing something post-Windrush and innovative and challenging and Linton Quasi Johnson and so on, right? That we were part of that first or second generation of people of color in London, and we had the responsibility, in a sense, to write. Hmm? You know, so we took the writing seriously. Apart from the royalties and the free trips, and, and as George Lamming said, um, not George Lamming, um, you know, you, you met you met interesting people, um, but you took it seriously because you you had immigrant status, and, and you did you had a kind of responsibility to voice, to give voice to the to the immigrant experience, in the same way that Sam Selvin said that when he came to London. People said to him, the Trinidadians, they have lions in Trinidad, you guys have tails, what happened to your tail, you know? And he felt the obligation to write. So that was a serious part of it. But you know, a lot of it was just sheer bloody-minded fun. Sheer fun, you go to the library, the university's paying you, people are paying you to write. I mean, what privilege, what greater privilege? You know, every month you're getting a salary, you just have to do two chapters. <laughs> And you find a nice library, hopefully where you can have a cigarette, you know? And, um, and, and so therefore, I would never take away that writing is about the sheer joy of writing. Apart from the social responsibilities and literary responsibilities and tribal responsibilities and ethnic responsibilities, mm -hmm. it's just the, 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 the challenge and the joy and the... And, 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 and the, and the um, the pleasure of writing, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to let you get away with this, but um, okay, I'm going to put this a different way. Um. <laughs> I'm, giving you, I'm giving you a real pain in your neck now, huh? You're just yeah. a pain in the neck. 
<laughs> okay, so in those first two collections, you're writing in a kind of creolized voice, whether it's Cooley Odyssey or Slave Song. You then shift in the next long poem in Turner to standard English, and you're writing about a very different experience, and you're, you're basing it on that famous painting by Turner of the slave being thrown overboard. And actually, that's a very bleak poem um, in some ways. And I just wondered if you can say something about that shift, because actually after Turner, you move also almost entirely into fiction and stop writing poetry. So there's two questions there. What, you know, I'd like you to read a little bit from Cooley Odyssey and from Turner to give the audience a sense of the different voices that you were using, but also to discuss that shift. And of course, Turner reflected your predominant concern with history both of the Black Atlantic and also the Indian diaspora, because there's an Indian character in that poem as well, Manu. Sorry to drag you into it. No. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of what you said, Sheila. Um, I didn't plan it, obviously. You write as the writing prompts itself. You, know, you write a page and that's it, you're off. And you didn't think, well, this is the black bit of me or this is the Indian part of me or... You really don't think about it. You just write what comes, and that's it. Though it might have, on reflection, a nice little sequence, you know. Um, but I, I, maybe I should read. Yeah. Do you want me maybe to read? The, maybe something from Cooley Odyssey, and then maybe a bit from Turner. Are we running out of time, though? No. No? We've <laughs> <laughs> still got the fiction to go. Turner is a long poem in about 25 pieces. So I'll just read the last section. Nigger, it cries, loosening from the hook of my desire, drifting away from my body of lies. I wanted to teach it a redemptive song, fashion new descriptions of things, new colors, Fountaining out of form. I wanted to begin anew in the sea, but the child would not bear the future nor its inventions, and my face was rooted in the ground of memory, a ground stampeded by herds of foreign men who swallow all its fruit and leave a trail of dung for flies to colonize, a tongueless earth bereft of song except for the idiot witter of wind through a dead wood. Nigger it cries, naming itself, naming the gods, the earth and its globe of stars. It dips below the surface, frantically it tries to die, to leave me beatless, nothing and a slave to nothingness, to the white and folding wings of Turner, brooding over my body, stopping my mouth, drowning me in the yoke of myself. There is no mother, family, savannah fattening with cows, community of faithful men, no elders to foretell the conspiracy of stars, magicians to douse our burning temples, no moon, no seed, no priests to appease the malice of the gods by gifts of precious speech, rhetoric antique and lofty beyond the grasp and cunning of the heathen and conquistador, chants, shrieks, invocations uttered on the first day spontaneously from the most obscure part of the self. When the, when the first of our tribe awoke, awoke and was lonely and hazarded foliage of thorns, earth that still smoldered, the piercing freshness of air in his lungs in search of another image of himself, no savannah, moon, gods, magicians to heal or curse, harvest, ceremonies, no men to plow, corn to fatten their herds, no stars, no land, no words, no community, no mother. So that was the stark um, ending of that, uh, of, that very, of that very stark uh, painting, you know, mm -hmm. where you had to aspire to the condition of the... Um, 
the drowned, the drowned sleeves. Hmm? Hmm. There's a sense, and in actually running right through your fiction and your poetry, I think, in terms of the kind of these silences and absences of, of a, I suppose, a lost mother or a stillborn. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm talking about it metaphorically, but that means there very much, obviously, in Turner. But it's also there in Cooley Odyssey and, and in your novels. Well, you know, let, let, let me say something in ending about um, women. And I got this from Jeremy Pointing, one of his essays. Um, uh, you know, when I was researching Indian indentureship, you know, there were mostly men who came in the boats. And so therefore, the few women, Indian women, who came in the boats uh, endured, at times, tremendous violence because of jealousy. So if she looked at another man in the plantation, her husband will beat her. You know, it also gave her some people, some women, a kind of a reverse pride, so they can say, "I can leave you. I got this one to go to." You know, she had a choice as well. You know, but the violence towards women in um, Guyana—I don't know about Trinidad. Well, uh, in Trinidad as well, because in Naples, Miguel Street, you have a man oiling his cricket bat to beat his wife. Do you remember? Yeah. yeah. Um, I definitely, definitely grew up with the knowledge. Uh, of women um, being um, uh, treated like, um, you, know, you know, treated badly, yes? Let me put it like this. I remember women being beaten. You're going to school as a boy, and, you know, you can hear... That's terrible. Okay. <laughs> um. Um, I think, obviously, yeah. we were going to go on to that. Um, you go to school as a boy and you hear a woman being eaten. And you can't do anything about it. It's not your mother, it's not your family. It's not your family. Yeah. That's sorry. That's I know. That's all your life. Okay. I've embarrassed myself. No, no, you haven't. I think... Um, I was just going to ask you one more question before throwing this out to the audience, which will take you off that subject, um, which is really to go back to the shift to fiction. I mean, is it the most recent novel, to bring you to something you've recently done, um, is, is full of this sense of a love of language. And it's, you know, to go back to the 18th century, it's the kind of, you know, it's a cacophony of sound, isn't it, of words. The evolution of the language in the 18th century is part of kind of Caribbean history, the evolution of all these different voices for which you're trying to create empathy in your writing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Johnson, uh, the last novel I did was um, one called Johnson's Dictionary, because I really do believe that, um, well, it's not me, I mean, anybody will tell you that um, the Bible and the, and, and the religious scriptures, the Quran, and the, and the dictionary were key to our our survival, I think, um, on the plantation, and our ascendancy in academia and in the literary world. Um, and I've always had a, a, a great deal of gratitude. Sometimes I feel it personally to Dr. Johnson, Samuel Johnson. I mean, these 18th century figures are living to me. I go to see Hogarth in his grave, and I talk to him. And I said to him, you know, I hope I didn't write anything rubbish about you, but I, I got paid, so, you know, sorry, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I talked to these old fellas, right? Dead white men of the 18th century. I like them. I, sometimes I dream about them, you know. So Samuel Johnson, um, I loved him anyway before I encountered his dictionary because in the 1740s at Cambridge University, at Oxford University, I beg your pardon, at high table and low table, the masters, the dons are drinking. He got up and he said, I drink a toast to the next, next insurrection of blacks in the West Indies. <laughs> 1746. He was a radical even then, right? You know? And then he had a servant called Francis Barber, who was black, who was not his servant, he was his son. Not his son in a literary, literary, literal way. And he loved 
He loved Francis Barber. He sent Francis Barber to school to learn Latin. He, he, loved, he would not send Francis Barber to buy oysters for his cat. His oy- cats used to eat oysters in those days. He said, Francis Barber is a human being. He should not be going and buying food for my animal. And when he died, Francis Barber was made the residual legatee of um, Dr. Johnson's estate and got quite a bit of money, which he, which he drank out, so he, <laughs> he, he benefited from it, right? So I've always um, thought that Johnson was somebody I wanted to write about. So the novel is really about a dictionary yeah. and how yeah. we come to words through yeah. the dictionary. Mm. No, it's a fascinating book. I mean, we're going to have to stop there and open, the, open it to the floor. We've got about five or six minutes left. Um, we could have gone on. I mean, David has got a very long um, career in also putting the Caribbean on the pedagogical map. Uh, he's broadcasted. He's, he's um, really been working flat out for the last 40 years in really bringing Caribbean writing to a wide public audience in all kinds of different ways. But let me open this now to the floor. Any questions? Gentlemen back. You said that you grew up in care, and immediately that brought to mind Lemon Sisse. And I just wondered, um, what similarities do you have with the man? Do you find some commonalities with him? Lem, yeah. yes. I haven't, I haven't see, I, Lem is one of the most generous people you can meet. I only did a reading with him once somewhere in, um, I met him two or three times. I don't really know him, but he and I ended up at the airport. We did a reading somewhere in Holland. And Lem is saying, let me say, look, I bought this duty free, David. I bought this. You, you keep one. You keep one. He's giving away his duty free. And I'm really proud to know, really proud. I came back to London a couple of years back. And I'm and in the South Bank, not far from where I um, was baptized by um, the urine of um, Austin Clark, is uh, four or five lines from Lem Sissy. Mm-hmm. I can't remember what they were, something about London. Beautiful. He's there in stone permanently. Hmm? And he's also the chancellor of a university. He is, yeah. yeah. Which, which university? Manchester. Manchester, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I see him more on television than in real life. Don't forget, I've been away for six years, you know. I'm only now back in England, yeah. So reconnect with Lem and people like that. Hmm. Jane. There's such a roll call of Guyanese writers, and you've mentioned so many of them, Wilson Harris, Sam Selvon, Pauline Melville, David Dabadine. Why do we never talk about Roy Heath? Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, Roy, Roy, Roy Heath and, if I may add, um, To Serve With Love, um, E.R. Brathwaite. Yeah? For some reason, they've slipped off the academic the academic curriculum. I mean, I, I invited um, Roy Heath, obviously, to Warwick, and he did a reading there. And um, repub- republished his arm. Um, are they coming for you or me? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we republished his um, novel um, on Indian, what's, it, what's the novel called, on Indian women? And when he died, we had a memorial for him at Warwick. But he slipped, yeah, people don't think of Roy Heath. I think, I don't know, I mean, is it because a lot of his work is not set in Britain? He was living in Britain, but a lot of it wasn't set in Britain. And I think he just didn't get picked up, you know, the, because of that, which is, is appalling, but it's... It just, it just may be fashionable. Some people yeah. are fashionable in fashion and, and, other, and, and, and then they're not, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, Roy Heath, I, I had to put down The Murderer, which was so fantastically well written, and it, and it built up to murder, and you can see the murder coming, and it was horrifying. That's how powerful that novel was. I, I never completed it. It was too frightening, you know? you know? I was too scared to continue reading it. It's so powerfully written. Hmm? So yes, Roy Heath, yes. Jeremy, just one more question, I think, because we're going to have to wrap up. Yeah. Sorry, to say at the minute we're looking at a biography of Roy Heath. Oh, great. And we will return to trying to negotiate a more reasonable price for reissuing Roy Heath's novels in the classic series. Hmm. 
too much was asked at the first <laughs> first instance. So I mean, yeah, we're very keen on. I mean, I'm you know huge fan of Roy his novels, particularly the earlier ones. So we we will try and do them. Yeah, and I think one of the things you did, I mean, amongst many, David, is you, you put some of these very early Guyanese, you found some, you know, in the archives, you found very early Guyanese writers, like an early version, Guyanese version of The Tempest, for example, and I think the first Guyanese novel you published, didn't you? Or, or got published? We, d we discovered this extraordinary man who died in 1890. He was 29 when he died. He was, he was bedridden all his life. He suffered from tuberculosis. He was bedridden all his life. He was 29 when he died. Uh, he, he won the first Nobel Prize, as it were, in the 1885, I think, Queen Victoria's uh, Golden Jubilee. She had an empire-wide prize, empire -wide prize for anybody who could add two verses to the British National Anthem. And Egbert, Egbert Martin, this bedridden African with a little bit of German blood in him from, from the past, he won the 50 pounds or whatever, which is big money in those days, and came to fame, and Tennyson praised him, and other, Eng other English poets praised him. Then he published his big, fat book in London, which must have been amazing for a guy, and he's called Leo's uh, Collected Works. And then, because he was very Christian and, 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 and pious, uh, and with echoes of Keats, because don't forget, he's, he's always dying, he's always concerned about morality, mortality. He then published a, a, lo, a book of poems called Leo's Local Lyrics in the 1780s, 1870s, which for the first time names the landscape of Guyana. It talks about Ginnip and Cherry and so on. This was important, because remember when Walcott started to write first, he said he, he felt reluctant to put the word mango or banana in a poem because it was not iconic, like the peach or the apple or, or the cherry, shop, you know, Shropshire, you know, those were iconic. Of course, it's hard to find a rhyme for banana anyway. <laughs> so, Egbert Martin names the landscape and the spirits of the landscape, the jumbies, the, j of the, the, the duppies of the landscape. And then he becomes the first West Indian ever to publish three books. I'm the first guy in his short story writer. We discovered a collection of four short stories he read called Scriptology, which are crazy. He's on something. It, just, it, it, it reminded me immediately of Wilson Harris. He, Egbert Martin, was on something, and he was. He used to take, um, um, this drug in the 19th century, that they took, um, yeah, mixed with rum. Laudanum. Eh? Laudanum mixed with rum. He had to take that for his pain, and it gave him visions. Maybe that's what I need. <laughs> <laughs> we when, should wrap up. Last thing, yeah. talk about that. When Huxley was dying, T.H. Huxley, his wife injected him with, um, with um, heroin. Heroin, I think. Is it heroin? Yeah. And apparently he had a lovely death. Hmm? I'll leave you with that. <laughs> Anyway, so just a round of applause for David, and thanks very much.